Hi, I'm Derek Lido, host of From the Ground Up, a show that uncovers the not-so-secret strategies of owners of bedrock businesses. Featuring conversations with entrepreneurs who build influential companies, we're going to take a deep dive into how successful businesses are created without having to shoot for the moon or take unnecessary risk. In this show, we're going to teach you how many great companies are built from the ground up. Welcome to From the Ground Up. I'm your host, Eric Lido. And on today's show, we welcome Natasha Gajewski, and she's CEO and founder of Simple Health, a platform that helps patients understand and visualize health information and efficiently communicate with their providers and other stakeholders. The consumer-facing Simple App has been a featured app on the iTunes Medical App Store for almost three years and is one of the Apple's favorite apps to promote. Natasha, thank you so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure. And so you're, you're, you're coming from, this is your home office? That is correct. And, and what, what you've done, most entrepreneurs would just dream about accomplishing. And uh, you've got a really great story of how you became an entrepreneur. Can, can you share that with us? Um, sure. I um I actually literally fell into entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. um, I fell down a flight of stairs when um, at a time when I was taking a lot of medications that were immunosuppressants, and um, in falling down those stairs, I actually got a kind of big scrape on my leg, which uh, needed to heal. And to facilitate healing, I had to go off these drugs that were um, that were treating another condition that I had. Um, and I was really excited about this opportunity to pause my medications because they were they were they were pretty intense drugs, and they didn't make me feel so good. Um, and I'd been on them for a long time, and they'd really impacted my quality of life. I mean, they also they made it better in many ways because they, they addressed my disease state. Um, but they also just made me smell gross and they tasted bad and, you know, I couldn't drink alcohol, which was like, you know, there was that. <laughs> um, so anyway, my, my doctor let me, you know, I, not let me, she suggests I you know, put them on pause for a little while. And I wanted to, um, I wanted to, I, w I was curious to see if in pausing those drugs, if, my disease would actually have gone into remission. Mm -hmm. um, and so I needed a way to, to, to track what was going to happen or what had been happening. And I figured that there would be an app that would make it really easy for me to track my symptoms over time. And there wasn't. So uh, I had to make one. <laughs> and that's what I did. So, so you know, it, m most people think to create an app, let alone a, a you know a, a super successful app, that you need to be a, a coding savant and uh, drink Red Bull all the time and stay up uh, you know <laughs> until the wee hours of the morning. And uh, uh, how well does that describe you? <laughs> um, not at all. I mean, I am familiar with wee hours of the morning, but not <laughs> because I stay up until them. Um, I get up at those times. <laughs> I think that I think that uh, having facility with coding um, is is really important. Mm -hmm. It's not. It was not the way I got started on entrepreneurship mm -hmm. and building an app, um, but it is some a skill that uh, I have felt the lack as I've progressed through the, mm -hmm. through, the through my journey um, in entrepreneurship. So I wouldn't say that it is a absolute barrier to entry. But having um, some facility with coding will certainly make your make your uh, getting started a whole lot easier. And so, again, mo most people would think that to have a successful app, it needs to be an app that grows like instantly to you know millions of downloads. And you know, you've been doing um, Simple Health now for um, you know five years or so. Is that uh, almost seven years. So, um, how are you a seven-year overnight success? <laughs> um, well, it's been a really interesting seven years. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's not, and I certainly did not have the hockey stick, um, the hockey stick growth profile that most people associate with 
um, startups generally and um, app startups specifically. Um, they depend on vi uh, a viral uptake and they're often fueled mm -hmm. by um, venture capital. And there's just a whole bunch of like concepts like that. None of those concepts really made sense for me personally be for a number of reasons. Number one, um, when I got started, I was trying to solve my problem. I wasn't looking to build a business that uh, I just, that's just not what I was set out to do. I mean, I was not in good health at the time and, um, and I truly had a problem that needed to be solved. Um, as I moved through the process, I, what happened was the product um, got good uptake at the beginning. Um, it, there's just, there was nothing else out there. And we it went up to, I think the top five or three or something like that in the, in the medical app store. And so, and then all the, you know, the feature requests started mm -hmm. rolling and, and that's when this, you know, that's when it started kicking into the next level of, of seriousness of purpose or, or a different purpose. Um, so, yeah. Well, when you, but when you started, you weren't a coder and you know, you were your own test alpha customer. So, so how did you get this coded up? The coding I've gone through. So what I did actually, and I should probably just step back, um, is I came up with the idea and I drew up some wireframes and a friend of mine, um, has suggested a mutual friend of ours, I think maybe Bob Monsoor. I don't know mm -hmm. if you if you knew him. Yeah, yeah. He he has suggested um, that I enter into some competition or validate my idea in some way before investing the money and building it yeah. and shipping it and kind of waiting to see what happens. That was really good advice because coding it. I mean, I did throw out some um, uh, some bids to see if I, you know how much it would cost to get just a real bare bones app built. And it was so expensive. I mean, it was like a $50,000 flyer, you know? Right. And um, that was obviously not reasonable. That was not a smart way to get started. So I did in fact do, you know, I flew out to California. I did this startup competition, um, ended up coming in second place, was voted most uh, fundable, got mm -hmm. some like loose commitments and came home. I'm like, oh, okay. I guess this isn't such a bad idea after all. And then I tapped my network that I had formed out there at that competition, and I got connected to a solo dev uh, developer out in Austin, and he wire he you know he built this quick and dirty, and we threw it out there, and you know, and it did well. I mean, it got good sure. uptake. And 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 then the feature requests started coming in. And then the feature requests started coming but, in. But but at that time you were also getting you know paid for your downloads. Yeah, yeah. So how did that all work? That all worked great. I mean, the app was able to stay revenue neutral. In other words, it was making the, it was making enough money to cover costs and, you know, mm -hmm. add a little more to it. Um, just pretty much the entire time. Um, but, you know, you have to be kind of nimble and smart and thoughtful about, you know, um, how you build, what you build. Um, you have to get creative and clever, you know, and, and what you, what you're willing to tackle and what you mm -hmm. have to set aside um, and what's, and what's not worth investing in. And you're, you're doing all of this. You're, you're, you're sort of uh, a prototypical uh, app entrepreneur and you're running a family with uh, kids and, you know, dinner on the table. And, and how does that work? I mean, Again, it's it's um, you're an example of how it does get done, but you're not what uh, most people visualize as you know app developer uh, you know supreme. Yeah, well, um, I, I would say it, it, happy accidents. There were a lot of happy accidents. Um, I did at one point. Um, the the app had grown to a point where it needed. Um, it needed to make a big, a, a big technological mm -hmm. leap. And so for about a year, I worked on putting together a team and raising venture capital. Mm -hmm. and, and the problem that, um, or, or the, the technology that we were looking to implement was basically, um, you know, moving the data off device and into the cloud. And, um, and I did not want to do that in a, in a cheap and, you know, in a, in a cheap way, because this mm -hmm. data was so potentially, you know, it's just so, 
so number one, it's very valuable, but number two, it's, you know, very vulnerable if, mm -hmm. it's, if it falls into the wrong hands. Um, so I did spend a you know while pursuing this sort of venture capital team based approach you know to grow like to make an exponential a giant you know really big step forward and at the end of the day um, one of the co founders I was working with was in a was in another startup that was just about to fail and or to close and then at the last minute they got a lifeline and so he all of a sudden had like it was our CTO mm -hmm. and he all of a sudden had to go. Um, Take, continue his 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 uh, obligation with this other company. Well, at the, it seemed it was devastating at the time, but it turned out in retrospect to be a really a really good thing because um, what we were going to build was actually going to solve a problem, but probably not the right problem, mm -hmm. as uh, healthcare has changed so dramatically in the last you know eighteen months. Um, we had a revenue model that no longer works with the chipping away at the ACA. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know. There's just been a lot of little like dodging of bullets that um, not intentionally, but sort of accidentally have allowed me to stay on the path, so to speak. Um, and I also, right from the get go, always, always privileged my family. Like if, I, if, if work was starting to take a, a downward was putting downward pressure on my family and quality of life for my kids. Like work had to, I just had, to, I had to take my foot off the gas and without venture capital um, or outside investors breathing down my neck, I was able to do that. So um, it turned out to be a really, really good thing. So you didn't take money uh, from venture capital and, and the company is still yours and you get to decide what you're going to do uh, every day for your company and for your family and for your team. Yeah. You know, it, the next, like, I, again, that, that big, you know, that big next um, mm -hmm. leap that I want to make, I still want to make it. Um, and it's not something I'll be able to bootstrap. You know, mm -hmm. I know that. Um, but I've got one kid going off to college this year, um, another one going into the, you know, into the cycle next year. So uh, I'm going to lay the foundation for that, whether it happens, you know, concurrently to this busy time in my family or it happens after, um, you know, we'll see how that all works out. But it's nice, really nice not to have that, uh, all that pressure of, having to you know get those huge metrics in to to you know to do the give the validation to those investors you know on a monthly basis or whatever it is it's keeping me kind of sane yeah and it, you know building slow and steady is actually the classic way the build businesses get built so um often when when companies go and press the the hyper growth button and bring in outside investors, uh, the business doesn't go as, as expected. You know, in, in the be beginning, you tested your model before you invested any money and you ultimately didn't have to because you found people in, in, as you went around and, and, you know, talked about your idea. So that's absolutely a, a classic of of how super incredibly valuable businesses get built unfortunately though you know there's such a there was there has been a huge hype cycle on the on this other you yeah. know way of grow, building and growing companies my husband's a small business owner my fam, you know my dad his father like we come from this long line of you know people who work hard build actual products mm -hmm. do it over time you know it, so it was it was really hard to swim in that that sea and just not come from that mindset of you know build fast break things it it was a way to build stuff and i'm sure it's a way to get things done um it just wasn't the right way for me certainly not at that time in my life so uh the over the years i mean your your app has maintained itself is incredibly popular uh, download and the like. And so uh, how have you fended off competition? Um, well, I haven't. I mean, there are competitors mm -hmm. out there. Um, the, 
I, w- I mean, there, there wasn't early on. I, mm-hmm. I, was, I was first to market for sure. Um, I, I think, you know, I, I'm not really sure. I, we have a quality product. Um, and I always made sure that the thing that was out there was something I was proud of. So it's not like we shipped perfect code with every, with every update. And, but when we did have a big mistake or even a small mistake, um, we fixed it. Like this is something I really care about and, and I want it to be its very best at all times. And if it is going to not deliver the thing that it, that I've promised, I, you know, like I, you just have to, you, you have to fix that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And that's, that's not, you know, apparently that's not something that, you know, is thought of a lot in this industry. I think, you know, and we're starting to see Mm -hmm. some repercussions for that. Um, It's old fashioned. I'm, you know, obviously I'm a lot older than Mm -hmm. your typical, you know, app entrepreneur, but you know, that's just, so I, I think, and I think I've built trust with my, with my user base. So a lot of, um, uh, people who do download it do it because of word of mouth or from clinicians. Uh, you know, we're also super concerned about privacy. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, as opposed to a lot of apps that were in this space, we're harvesting data and reselling it, placing ads, that sort of thing. I didn't want to do that. I didn't like it when it was done mm-hmm. to me. So, um, yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess if you just, you may not have the fat, you know, the, the fanciest, sexiest product, but if you have something that functions and that you take care of and that delivers on its promises, you know, maybe that's good enough to, to yeah. stick it out. Yeah. So, so how, how did you get comfortable working with your coders and coding team? I mean, just, just having that conversation is something that uh, <laughs> a, a lot, dissuades a lot of people from even trying, you know, even though they have good ideas. <laughs> When I think, I mean, what I know now versus what I knew seven years ago, mm-hmm. I'm just, it's just like, oh, it's, I cringe at some of the dumb things that I've said. But, you know, you have to be willing to be uh, wrong and you have to be willing to be, um, uh, what am I looking for? Not stupid, but like uninformed, you know, mm-hmm. like you, you have to be, will- if, if you can't, if you're, if you take yourself too seriously, um, you won't be able to deal because especially like seven years ago, like the bro culture and all that, like you just, you had to have a pretty thick skin, you know? <laughs> but, um, but since then, like it's evened out a lot. I mean, I think coding has become a little, has been a lot, has become much more accessible. There are a lot more coders. You can go overseas. People want, people are looking for the business more now than mm-hmm. they were back, you know, seven, eight years ago. Um, or they're looking for work. Um, I don't know. I, I, and I also, I love learning new stuff. So whenever I'd hear a term that I didn't understand, I'd write it down or like I go, you know, I go into my own code and Mm -hmm. I look for um, stuff that's wrong and I, you know, Google it to see, okay, well, what does this mean? What's this fault that, you know, is popping up or whatever. I just like to figure stuff out. So to me, um, I don't know. I like, I like learning stuff. Didn't intimidate me too much. (laughs) Not too much. (laughs) So, so, um, you know, how did, how did you figure out how to assess quality code and quality coders? That is an excellent question. Um, you know, early on, I didn't worry about it that much because I wasn't, mm-hmm. you know, I just didn't have that many users and didn't know what was going to happen. Um, as the code base got uh, bigger and more complex and the user base grew, um, I was what I ended up doing, you know, I, I I learned about this concept of a code audit. Um, and I would fork the repo and have a friend look, look it over. But then I also hired, um, a third party to, to manage, uh, the dev. So, so I just had multiple sets of eyes looking at the, uh, app at the code itself. And then we do some runtime tests just to make sure there wasn't any junk in there yeah. that was, you know, everything I could, we could do that, and that I could do to guarantee that the code was number one, coherent and quality code, but um, also that there just wasn't any extraneous crap in there that um, I would not be able to yeah. see. 
and 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 you sounds like you were very open to asking for help from outsiders. Sometimes you had to pay for it, and sometimes you didn't. But, but yeah, uh, exactly, exactly. I have a friend who's in you know who's involved, and in, he writes code for another company. And he he would just he he would always get a copy, and you know periodically look at it. But plus, knowing you know any dev that's looking at it knows mm -hmm. there's multiple eyes looking at this code. I did think at some at one point about open sourcing it. Um, but I, it just, it was a really complicated, that, that was just such a, that was a big, big leap and I didn't really know how to do that or, you know, it just didn't seem quite seem to work, but that's something I keep, I keep in the back of my mind too. So you reached out for help from the very beginning, uh, our mutual acquaintance, Bob Monsoor and the like. So who, who have been the pivotal people that uh, have, have really given you the advice? you know, uh, advice that has given you uh, either the, you know, insight or the, um, or the courage or, you know, or whatever it was that you needed to, uh, to move forward as successfully as you have. Well, a really good friend of mine, Jeff Barrett, um, it's like we have a monthly talk and he sort uh -huh. of can, he can print, he's, he said, he says he's charted my, entrepreneurial moods on a calendar. So he calls okay. me in February. He's like, Oh, it's February. You must be feeling depressed right now. The app is not doing the way you want. He, he, I, mean, I, get, I guess my moods are cyclical. There's all these things that have become predictable. So he's like, you know, he's been a great friend and he helps me um, just kind of stay lighthearted or, or I don't know, just not, not get too serious and, and too uh, emotional about stuff. And then Bob, of course, has been great. He, you know, connected me with this whole startup, um, startups, the notion of startups for crying out loud. I mean, I didn't even know about the idea of startups. You know, of course, now everybody does. But, um, you know, five, six, seven years ago, that was it was still kind of a growing topic. Um, my husband has been an invaluable resource because he's a, you know, he's a businessman. He's run a, been running a small manufacturing business here in New Jersey for couple decades now and he's seen it all I mean he has seen it all this notion of defensibility like sure you know I could have learned it from um, Fred Wilson um, but I learned about it really from my husband who's been dealing with China for the last 15 years you know um, keeping a small business afloat while grappling with all that so um, I, there's been a number there's been quite a few um, mentors and advisors that I've had and um, I've worked at the Keller Center. I, you know, you and I would talk quite a bit. Um, it's it's been great. I learned a lot from the universe, the, mm -hmm. the kids at the university that I've mentored. I mean, I was supposed to be mentoring them, and they end up like <laughs> teaching me stuff. So, and then your your app has um, basically propelled you onto the national, into that national health management conversation, and and now you're you're part of. Uh, you know, uh, other organizations have pulled you in to uh, get your inputs and advice and the like. Uh, so, uh, how did that happen, and, and how do you, how do you manage that part of now your your life? Um, well, it for the a couple of years, I said yes to like every invitation. I, you know, I'd go to these various conferences and I'd talk to people and I'd meet, I was really curious. I mean, I, I didn't know that much about healthcare, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the business of healthcare. So I needed to learn stuff. Um, and so I'd go to these conferences and then I, uh, I would get invited to just sort of sit on these panels and represent the, um, you know, the patient population for lack of a better word. And at the time it was, you know, for a long time it was appropriate because I was still a patient. I was still under, you know, medical management and I did identify somebody who had, you know, who was, was in treatment, let's say. Um, and then as I got better, I couldn't, I couldn't do that as much. I, I just didn't feel right, right? Like I, it didn't feel right to be sitting up on stage representing a group of people that I was no longer an active participant mm -hmm. in. And, and I did do it a little bit, but it started feeling more and more fake. And then I, you know, I sort of, and I stopped doing it. Um, so since that time, I've continued to participate, but not anywhere near as much as I did. 
um, in the past. I, and I do, you know, if I do take a speaking engagement, um, I, I try hard to talk about something that's still relevant, you know, either building, you know, products, running a small business, you know, uh, women-centered entrepreneurship, um, but not so much the patient experience or patient engagement related things. <laughs> so, so you talk about your, your emotional seasonality <laughs> with the business. So uh, what are the things that, that make you feel, uh, you know, elated about what you do and what are the things that, you know, stress you out and, and that you, <laughs> hopefully figure out how to mitigate or manage? Um, the things that I love are um, just hearing from end users. So the feedback email, like the feedback uh, or, or the, the help resource that we offer basically ends up in my inbox. And, you know, oftentimes I end up conversing with, with end users and either helping them figure something out or, you know, um, dealing with feature requests or, you know, whatever. Um, and, and they tend to be, they often get to be conversational or I shouldn't say often. They, they sometimes get conversational and it's just, it's kind of nice like to talk to people and to be doing something that makes their lives a little bit easier. Um, what stresses me out and depresses me is keeping up with, uh, the federal regulations surrounding healthcare. <laughs> And to put a ton of money and effort into complying with very, you know, rules and regulations for them to either, you know, not be implemented or to get pushed back or to be, you know, just eradicated altogether. So, um, and that's been, and I think that's actually been a depressor for um, health information technology entrepreneurship in the last like two years. So, or whatever, 18 months. Um because you know you make a big investment right like you you have to do a thing and you make an investment to make it happen and then the thing is no longer you know either required or no longer relevant or you know and you just you know it's just it's exhausting um so i'd say yeah those two things <laughs> <laughs> well uh um Sometimes I wish I had made like a social like dating app or something. <laughs> like it's like ugh, regulated, you know, privacy. Like yeah, and you have to learn so much. But it but you did something that you wanted and needed, and ultimately, th those are always the stories that lead to the you know to the successes, and and what you describe about the the you know the thing that you you like best about uh, being an entrepreneur is, is hearing from your customers and that you actually made their lives better is also it, it's the fundamental principle of entrepreneurship is that you make some group of people happy enough that they gladly give you money in return you you, you are the 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 role model here well we'll see you know we'll see we we you know you bring up uh entrepreneurship is making people happy and they give you money in return mm -hmm. this is this is a challenge right now um and there is an education that's happening right now like as in the last month um we were a pay you know we operated on a paid model initially and then moved to a freemium model which is you know you get a free download mm -hmm. and then you have to pay to upgrade and um i don't i don't obsess on uh feedback i mean um what are they called reviews like app store reviews mm -hmm. that much but i you know almost all of my one star reviews of which they were used used to be none um lately there have been more which i hear is it's supposed to be a good thing but um it's all about pay they don't want you know people don't want to pay for stuff and you know, and I have been working hard to educate people. Like if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. Like this mm -hmm. is finally starting to, to percolate. And this, you know, this latest, most recent conversation um, about violations of privacy and data security, um, you know, hopefully people are going to start to understand a little bit better. You got to pay yeah. at some point. Yeah, yeah. You, you do. And our entrepreneurship will go away and uh, our, our society counts on entrepreneurs to create the new jobs and to, uh, you know, uh, deliver the innovation and, and provide a substantial fraction of all of their growth in GDP. So absolutely.
but but it's a challenge to feel uh, you know, figure out how to make them happy enough that they you know do give you the money in return. Well, I mean, for 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 the app economy, what the, the challenge is is that there was so much that was pumped out that was yeah. free, um, in a that the user was not being monetized in a way that they were aware of, right? Yeah. Um, and you know, and and th there was a time, you know, early on when we were, you know, the numbers were. The downloads were strong and, you know, and we did seek it, you know, we did receive attention um, from folks that were interested in, in purchasing our data because structured health data is just about the most, you know, valuable data there is. Um, but, I, you know, I was like, eh, I don't, I can't do that. Like it just, number one, it would make sense, you know, people would stop using the app if they knew I was, you know, if I was delivering their no. secrets to whatever industry. Um, but it just wasn't the right thing to do. I didn't want to, that wasn't the problem I was looking to solve. So, um, but you know. Well, when you, when you accept advertising or sell the data, then they become the customer and then they drive your business. And, and ultimately, you know, pure entrepreneurship is, is about, you know, caring about your, your actual users and, and making them happy enough that they give you money in return. And, and, and sure, that's always evolving because, uh, you know, their expectations are changing with time and the like. And, and that's why so many businesses, after they have sort of a, a good run, die off and, um, and their, their founders go away or are fired or, or whatever. And uh, to be able to sustain an app now for, for seven years, again, puts you in a pretty... Uh, you know, unique category of, of entrepreneurs and, uh, and, and makes you such a, a great role model. <laughs> well, we're not, you know, not done yet. Like mm -hmm. it, my, the thing I'm thinking about now is, you know, um, I've been kind of focused um, on the user, user experience and the, this uh, uh, sort of narrow um, understanding of what the product is, what it does and who it serves. Um, and what we had been working towards was, you know, strengthening or improving this relationship between patient and clinician. Um, and I want to get back, I want to go back there. I want to, I want to get back into, uh, into, into that next iteration. And, um, and I think that the way we're going to end up doing it is looking at collaborations. So, mm -hmm. um, now that the dust is sort of settling a little bit on, you know, ACA and what's going to stay and what's going to, you know, is going to get repealed, um, or not. Um, I, I'm, we can now start looking again at like having those conversations about collaborations with other um, HIT uh, products and, and product lines and um, look at, you know, some new revenue models and creating synergies that at the end of the day will 100% benefit the end user, but perhaps some other relationships as well. So specifically like clinicians, telemedicine integration, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Yeah, that would be. That will be great. Well, um, I, I, I'm so glad that uh, you agreed to do this and, and, and share so candidly, you know, your experience and, and do it in such a way that we can share it with others and, and use you as a, a true role model, which you deserve to be. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Yeah. And um, so I, I can't thank you enough. Um, we're, we're we're at the end of uh, this episode of, uh, you know, from the ground up. And um, so thank you so much for, uh, you know, being on the show. Uh, I also thank uh, our production uh, support team from Microfame Media. And also, you know, most of all, our audience that, um, that ultimately are trying to figure out enough about bedrock businesses such as yourself that uh, that they get the courage or, or the understanding to to deliver the values and the ideas that uh, they can to to a society that needs it so badly. Absolutely. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Natasha. Great seeing you. Thank you. Great to see you too. Okay. Bye bye.